All right. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I want to welcome each of you here at our Tyson's location, as well as our locations in Montgomery County and Arlington and Prince William, especially to our Loudoun location, which I have the joy of serving as location pastor. My name is Britton Taylor, and I am excited to open up God's Word with you uh, this morning. Uh, this past week, I spent the week at kids' camp. Yeah. I asked a few of you uh, to be praying for me that I would make it out alive, and your prayers were answered. Uh, and we uh, spent some incredible uh, time together uh, with these kids. I think we have a couple of pictures uh, just to show. But I, I wanted to just report back to you of all that God did this past week. Um, what an incredible time we had. Our kids ministry leaders and volunteers from each location invested uh, their time and energy in pouring into these precious image bearers of God who have boundless energy. Uh, we learned so much. We learned uh, and were reminded of just how big our God is. Some of our kids uh, have learned this from a young age, and we were just building on, uh, on the, uh, the foundation that had already been invested into them uh, from, their, from their parents and caregivers. Uh, we talked about how magnificent God is. We learned that God has a great love for us in Jesus. Um, and, and though many of our kids uh, knew this and were growing in this uh, truth, there were others uh, like one awesome young boy that I had the privilege of spending some time with that had little exposure to the love of God in Christ. And we were able to share with him all that God had done for him uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, so we learned that God is big. We learned that he has a special love for us in Jesus. And we also learned, or actually I learned something very valuable. If you're going to kids camp, and I assume this is going to be the case for middle school camp and high school camp in the coming weeks, but if you decide to get into the gaga pit, you need to have your game face on, okay? It is all out war in the gaga pit at kids camp. Um, in all seriousness, I want to show you a quick video. Uh, the first part of the video just shows you the energy that our kids brought to camp. And then the second part shows you how we ended each night of camp uh, worshiping Jesus. So watch this video with me. Was that not just incredible to see those precious little ones singing praises to our God? It was a great time. Just a quick shout out to our kids ministry leaders and volunteers. Uh, you did an awesome job this week. Uh, and just an encouragement uh, to each of you. If you are not invested in passing down the gospel to the next generation, I commend our kids ministry to you. Uh, I, I hope you will take time out of your day today uh, to reach out to your location's uh, kids ministry team leader and say, put me in coach. Just email them. That's all you got to say. Header, put me in coach. Uh, and we'll get you investing your time and, and uh, in investing resources into these precious uh, children. Our kids are too important, church. We need to double down our efforts in engaging their little hearts with the greatest news ever, that God loves them in Christ Jesus. All right, so today, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to look at one verse, just one verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. Now, it's arguably the most well-known verse in all of the Bible. Many of you have heard it from a very young age. At least most of us have seen it on a poster at a football game. One theologian called the verse the gospel in miniature, and that seems to be a good description of it. In so many ways, 
This verse is a synopsis of God's message to all of the human race. Now, I know some of you hear that we're going to be looking at John chapter 3, verse 16 today, and you, and you think, you know what, I've already graduated from that. I've already moved on and I've mastered these elementary concepts, and I've progressed into deeper and more complex truths. And if that's your posture towards this verse today, then my prayer for you is that you would hear afresh its wonderful truths, and you would regain the awe and amazement that come from knowing the truths of John chapter 3, 16. Some of you have read it, even memorized it, and you're just no longer moved by this verse, and familiarity can harden us over, our, over time. It can dull our response to things that we once found extraordinary. And for you, if that's you, if you're in that category, I'm praying that you would too regain the wonder of the truths that are contained in this verse and allow it to reshape your desires and your longings. But I also believe that there might be some people in here who've never heard of John 3.16. Maybe uh, you were invited in by a friend or coerced by a parent, or maybe you were just uh, bumped into someone this week who uh, invited you to attend a Sunday worship service at McLean Bible Church, and, and here you are. You're trying your best to track along and see what this is all about, and I just want to tell you that I'm so glad you are here, and I've prayed for you that you would, for the first time, see who Jesus is and how much he loves you. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 16, regardless of who you are, of what you've come through, no matter where you find yourself today, this is the best news you will ever hear. Amen. I want to read this verse, I want to pray for us, and then I want to spend some time looking at three life-changing truths from John chapter 3, 16. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray together. God, we are so thankful for your word this morning. What a treasure it is. What a glorious gift it is. You have given us your word so that we would know your son and we would experience eternal life in him. The words we just read, God, are not just some uh, ancient text, not just some uh, religious words from the past. These words are from the living, reigning, eternal God. These are your words. And we want to know you more deeply and more accurately, more intimately as we consider this verse today. Would you pour out your grace and accomplish incredible things in our lives today as we look to you in your word? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I remember pretty vividly waking up one day in a church pew. In a church pew. I was about seven years old. And my mom and my grandmother had taken me and my brother, who was a year older than me, to a church revival. Now, some of you speak that lingo, okay? You, you're tracking with me. But others of you are like, a church what? Uh, it's a church revival. Uh, the, the part of the, the country where I grew up in, the, the churches oftentimes would hold revivals throughout the year. And that typically means that they would have worship services for some consecutive nights during the week. And they would bring an outside preacher to come in and he would preach his heart out with the aim of seeing many people make decisions for Jesus. Well, when that preacher was preaching his heart out that night, I dozed off. And I'm not talking about just like kind of a little head bobbing dozing off. I was gone, like laid out in the pew sleeping. And I remember waking up uh, and looking around and realizing I missed the entire worship service. I just missed it all. And, and people were standing around, they were talking, and I saw my mom and my grandmother, but I didn't see my brother. And so I went up and I asked my mom, I said, well, mom, where's, where's my brother? And I, I'll never forget when she said, she looked at me and she said, he got saved. And I was so confused. Saved from what? 
Saved by who? Like, do I need to be concerned right now? Am I in imminent danger? Like, what's going on? Where's my brother? And she said, well, when the preacher got to the end of his sermon, he asked if anyone wanted to be saved and become a Christian, and my brother raised his hand. And she shared that they walked him to the back of the church, and he's back there meeting with church staff right now. So to be honest with you, I was, I was pretty unimpressed in the moment, okay? But we waited for him and waited, and eventually he walked out from back of the church, and we went home. Now, that situation nagged me over the coming days. There was a lot going on in my little life, and on top of that, I never liked for my brother to have something that I didn't have, so I began to ask questions like, how can I be saved, right? And over the coming weeks and months, my mom and my dad and even my grandmother began to share how I, too, could be saved. And I remember when they described heaven, I just wasn't that impressed. I was like, I don't know, like that doesn't seem all that great. But when hell entered into the equation, like I started, started realizing, like, okay, like I need, I need something to happen here. I don't, definitely don't want to go there. And so at some point in time uh, after that, I made a decision that I w- didn't want to go to hell, that I knew that Jesus died on the cross for sins, and he was my only shot at not going to the place where I didn't want to go. So I professed belief in him, and I began to identify as a Christian. I probably even prayed a prayer or many prayers praying and telling him that I believed in him, that I didn't want to go to hell. Now, before you get all excited, let me tell you what changed in my life as a result of that. Not much. Not much at all. You see, I still found heaven to be incredibly unattractive, and I certainly didn't want the alternative, uh, but heaven just didn't seem all that great. At best, I had a surface-level interest in God. He was a means to an end. And he could could keep me from having to go to the place that I didn't want to go, but I wasn't really that interested in him either. Now, if you would have asked me in the years following that, Britton, are you a Christian? I would have happily said yes. And if you were to have asked me why I believe I was a Christian, I would have pointed to verses like this. And Could even have quoted John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what makes me a Christian. But let me ask you a question today. What exactly does this verse mean? Is my story as a young child an example of what it means to be saved? Does John chapter 3, verse 16, allow for this type of response to the gospel? What I want to do over the next few minutes is take this verse, phrase by phrase, understanding each phrase and then seeking to apply its truth uh, to our lives along the way. So the, for the for the first phrase, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the God over everything loves each one of us. For God so loved the world. This verse starts with God, for God, but the question has to be asked, who's God? Who is God? Now, A.W. Tozer says that the most important thing about each of us is what just came into our mind when I asked that question. Who is God? We can gloss over this word so quickly, but this word represents the greatest imaginable being. For God so loved the world. Now, right out of the gate, you can see how the greatest news ever can turn into decent news, or average news, or mediocre news. To see this as the greatest news ever, we must see God for who he has revealed himself to be. A.W. Tozer goes on and he says, it is not a cheerful thought that millions of us who live in a land of Bibles, who belong to churches and labor to promote the Christian religion, may yet pass our whole life on this earth without once having thought or tried to think seriously about the being of God. Who is this God? We need to press into this question. 
Last month, we were reading in our Bible reading plan through the prophet of Isaiah. And just a quick encouragement, if you're not doing this already, following along with this Bible reading plan, I encourage you to jump on board and finish off the second half of 2022 with us. It's been an incredible time each day reading a chapter from the Old Testament, chapter from the New Testament. I assure you it will be well worth your time. But we came to Isaiah chapter 40 last month. I'm not sure if some of you remember reading this chapter. But I, I remember sitting down and reading Isaiah chapter 40, and at the end of the chapter, I sat there stunned in silence at the greatness of our God. And what I want to do today is I want you to listen just to a portion of Isaiah 40, and I want you to hear about the greatness of our God. Verse 21 says, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Like its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Then I should be like him says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because his strong power, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard the Lord is an everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Amen. And listen, this God, for this God so loved the world. He so loved the world. Now, this is anything but boring. This is anything but dull. Ladies and gentlemen, this is shocking. This is shocking that this God would love the world. The gospel starts with God. The greatest news ever starts with God, a God that we could never fully comprehend, the more glorious than we could ever begin to imagine, perfectly holy in his posture toward us, his heart towards us is love. It's love. Now, how does God love? How does God love us? Well, God so loved the world. God so loved the world. That word so, S-O, might be one of the most important words in the entire verse. And that says a lot. That says a lot. That word so, it, in fact, it's, it's, in the, it's at the beginning of the verse in the original language. They put, the, the author put it at the beginning of the verse so that it would stand out, that it would be emphasized in this verse. And what he's saying is he's in, explaining how did God love this world? Not a little. Not in moderation. God so loved this world. He so loved this world. One way of thinking about it is, is, is the intensity of this love. He so loved the world. He wasn't stingy with his love. He has an enormous love for us. And that's not because we are lovable people, contrary to popular opinion. He doesn't love us because we are lovable people. And we know that because just a few verses later in John chapter 3, verse 19, it says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, there it is, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Amen. Who is the world, in verse 16, that God intensely loves? Well, it's fallen, sinful, broken, weak 
humanity. And every one of us finds ourselves in that category. We all have done things that we fear one day will be exposed. We all have done things that we fear would be brought to the light. Words that we've spoken, things that we've done, thoughts that we've entertained in our mind, and we are terrified for it to come to the light. And too often, people try to ignore this reality. They try to cover up and just not think about it. They try to run and hide or put on a nice smile and act as if everything is okay. But deep down, do we not know everything is not okay? Everything is not, is not okay. G.K. Chesterton was asked the important question, what is wrong with the world? What is wrong with the world? And his answer was, I am. I am. You see, when we start seeing God for who he is, we start seeing who we are, then we realize our quick fixes will never remedy our problem. Our quick fixes will not get it done. We need something that can only come down to us from heaven. We need God's love. We need his mercy. And he's given it to us. For God so loved the world. That word so not just refers to the intensity of his love, but it also refers to the type of his love. The type of his love. It's, it's this, it's, it's God so loved the world, or God loved the world in this way, that he loved the world in this way, which leads us to the second phrase, that he gave his only son. That he gave his only son. God gave us the greatest gift of all, his son. He didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us his son, his only son. Now, for those of us who grew up in Christian circles, we hear this and we just move right on about our day. Yeah, God gave us our son and then move right on of what's next in life. But for those of you who this is new, or for those of you, by God's grace, this is landing on your hearts in a fresh way that just stopped you dead in your tracks, and it should. God's love moved him to give us what we did not deserve, namely Jesus, to give us his only son. Only there means irreplaceable. There's no other. There's no other other than the matchless son of God, and this this. This son was given to us, and he came for us, and oh boy, did he come. He came to live the life that we were supposed to, but we chose not to. He came and lived a perfect life, and at the end of that perfect life, he died the death that we all deserved. He fulfilled every demand of God in our place, and then he rose from the dead three days later, victorious, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yes. Yes. Now, it's important to note that God will not sweep your wrongs under the rug and look the other way. He won't do it. He is just and he is holy. He will not sweep your wrongs under the rug and look the other way. God exposes your wrongs, and then he pays for them in full by the death of his perfect, matchless, only son. The Bible does not tell us that God's going to pat us on the back if we give it our best. And some of us in this gathering are giving it our best, hoping and just crossing our fingers that we'll get that good pat on the back. We did, we did our very best. And can I tell you something? That is not going to happen. The Bible is much more honest with our condition. Our situation, ladies and gentlemen, are, is dire. We need something to happen that can only come from heaven. Amen. We deserve nothing but judgment. Yep. But in the greatest news ever, in the gospel, we don't get what we deserve. 
we get Jesus, the greatest gift ever given. So we no longer have to hide in shame. We no longer have to run in fear. We no longer have to ignore our issues. We no longer have to fake it. Why? Because God has made a way for weak and weary sinners to find a welcome in his presence through Jesus, the only Son of God, the only Son of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his excellent book, Life Together, he says, you are a sinner, a great desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to a God who loves you. He wants you as you are. He does not want anything from you, a sacrifice, a work. He wants you alone. You can hide nothing from God. The mask you wear before men will do no good before him. He wants to see you as you are. He wants to be gracious to you. You do not have to go on lying to yourself and to your brothers as if you were without sin. You can dare to be a sinner. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know what's amazing about this verse? Anyone can get in on this. Anyone. Is that not shocking? Whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Anyone can get in on this. Now, to be clear, everyone will not get in on this. We know that because of John chapter 3, verse 18. Two verses later, it says, whoever believes in him, there's that phrase, believes in him, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the Son of God, but anyone can get in on this. Eternal life is available to anyone who believes in Jesus. And here's the reality that faces each of us today. Every one of us will either perish or we will have everlasting life in Jesus. Those are the only two options. Let me put an idea before you that I hope will bring some needed perspective for every single one of us today. We all are on our way to our own funeral. Every one of us are headed to our own funeral. Now, you might not have wanted to come in here and entertain the thought of your own death, but I want to be very clear This is needed perspective for us whose lives are so busy and so distracted. Every single one of us are headed to our own funeral. A few months ago, I went to a funeral. It was a funeral of one of the most special people in my life. It was my grandmother. She was my nanny. She was the greatest grandmother to ever live. Now, I no disrespect to some of the grandmothers here, but she was the greatest, okay? She was amazing. She was there when my life unraveled. She was a constant source of encouragement. She loved to talk to me about Jesus. And yes, it's the same grandmother that took me to that church revival when I was a child. And about two months ago, after some complications with her health, she died. And a few days after that, we were at her funeral, celebrating her life, yes, but also coming to grips with the fact that her brief life was over. In this world, I will never be able to pick up the phone and call her again. I will never be able to go to her house and swing on her front porch and just spend time with her, not in this life, never again. As I grieved her death, I remembered a handwritten letter that my nanny wrote me several years ago on the day that my family and I moved overseas. Now, not, not many people handwrite letters anymore, but before you is one of my most prized possessions. It's a handwritten letter from my nanny. 
And she started off just by telling me, just encouraging me and speaking words of life like she always did. And she gets to the end of this handwritten letter and she says this, just always remember how much I love you. If by chance we don't meet again on this earth, I will be just inside the heavenly gates. Look for me. I will be there. I promise. Amen. She said, I love you. And she signed it, Nani. Amen. The reality is, is we were able to see each other again. But as of April 22nd of this year, I will not see her again on this earth. And I'm sad, and I do miss her every single day, but I want you to know the good news of Jesus, the best news, is because Nani believed in him, she did not perish, but right now has eternal life. She has eternal life. This is the good news of Jesus. Because she believed in him, she has eternal life. Now, what does it mean to believe in him? Is that not critically important here? What does it mean to believe in him? Well, just looking at this verse and, and taking it phrase by phrase, surely it doesn't mean mild agreement with Jesus. Certainly it doesn't mean some surface level commitment it doesn't mean that you like Jesus and some of the things that he can do for you. And we're seeing this in John chapter 3, 16. Just think about, just plug that in, mild agreement with Jesus. For this infinitely great and glorious God so loved the world, this sinful world, this rebellious world, that he gave his unique son as a sacrifice so that anyone who says, yeah, I like him, well, has eternal life. No. Absolutely not. When we see God's enormous love for us, weak and weary sinners, it draws out from us so much more than merely intellectual agreement. And now I see it. I see it. Not as I did when I was seven years old, when I just wanted a quick fix for a threat of punishment. No, I see it with new eyes that the love of God in Jesus is altogether worthy of my worship and it's worthy of my life. And it happened when I was 20 years old after reading the New Testament, coming face to face with the truth claims of Jesus, I fell to my knees and confessed my great need for him and submitted my life to him. And guess what changed? Everything, everything. That word believe in is so important. In the original language, you can also translate it into the English word into, whoever believes into him. Theologians call this union with Christ. We enter into Christ, into him. Listen, union with Christ is not us adding Jesus onto our life. It is by grace through faith, us entering into him. Believing in him means that we come to see our own dire condition, our inability to remedy it, and then we see all that Jesus has done and we run to him as our only hope, as our only hope. And he becomes our savior, our Lord. He becomes the greatest treasure of your life. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been following him for over 20 years now, and he is greater and better than he has ever been to me on this day. Amen. This is who the Son of God is. Whoever believes in him, would you look to Jesus in this way? Would you believe into him, which will result in a radical reorientation of your life? He will become the center of it all. Would you look to him? Would you believe in him? Whoever believes in him has eternal life, present possession. That's real life with Jesus today and every single day forward, forever, forever. So do you see it? 
Do you see the massive love of God for weak and weary sinners? For when they come to the end of themselves and believe in the Son of God, believe into Jesus, they find salvation. They're gifted eternal life. And he becomes their greatest treasure of all. What a gospel. What great news for us today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. A few points of application and we're done. For those of you who have not yet believed in Jesus, for those of you who have not yet believed into Jesus, not asking today if you have intellectually agreed If you've given the tip of the hat, or if you understand some historical truths, I'm asking you, have you believed into Jesus? If you have not come with empty hands of faith to the Son of God, would you do that right now? Don't wait another minute. There is no need for you to clean yourself up. When you come to Jesus, for the forgiveness that you do not deserve and the new life that you cannot earn, he graciously gives it all, all of it. John chapter one, verse 16 calls it grace upon grace. I love that phrase, endless grace. Believe in him, believe in the son of God. The remarkable reality for us today is that Jesus is welcoming weak and weary sinners into the presence of God who come to the end of themselves and say, I have nothing to give, but I look to you, Jesus. Will you believe today? Right where you are, right where you're sitting, God loves you. And he loves you so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. For those of us who have believed in Jesus, you've believed into him, let me ask you this question. Are you living the Christian life in the freedom of being fully known and fully loved in Christ Jesus? Are you living out your life in such a way that reflects the great glorious truth that God fully knows you and he fully loves you? You can travel the world and there is nothing greater that can be found than that truth right there. That in Jesus, you can be fully known. You do not have to hide. You do not have to run. You can be fully known and fully loved, and fully loved because of what Christ has done for you. May God awaken in us this reality of the love of God. Would he awaken us? Would he cause us to see the glories of his son? Would he awaken us to see the reality of eternity right before us? And would we turn to him with empty hands of faith, trusting him, hoping him, loving and following the Son of God. Would you pray with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just wanna give a few moments in our gatherings for each of you to have an opportunity to believe in the Son of God. Come before him with empty hands and say, yes, Jesus. The remarkable truth is that Jesus didn't come into the world to make you feel worse. He came into the world to spotlight. He didn't come into the world to spotlight your wrongdoings. He came into the world to save sinners. And so would you go to him in prayer? 
even now, would you go to him in prayer? Heavenly Father, we have seen wonderful truths from a very familiar verse. And now I pray grace upon grace in each of our lives to awaken us to believe in Jesus. To be able to see in a fresh way the love that you have for us, God, in the finished work of Jesus. That he came to do what we could not do and he died in our place and he accomplished it all. So now I pray for every single person in this gathering that we all would come to Jesus in faith. Whether it's for the first time, empty hands, we bring nothing to this relationship. And would you open our eyes to see the glory of Jesus. For those of us who are in Christ, would you give us the grace and the mercy, the grace upon grace, to live out the reality of this wonderful relationship that we enjoy with you, God. That it wouldn't be something that we just do uh, every so often, that we pay attention to once a week, but this would be the source of our life. It would be the center of our being that God, you so love the world, you gave your only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.